Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney. And I'm Robert Travis Scott, President of the Public Affairs Research Council of Louisiana. Well, tonight we examine two segments of society that are very much like siblings living at home. They share the same space, depend on each other for support, but also don't always see eye to eye. We're talking about athletics and academics, college sports in Louisiana. Well, if the relationship between these two is like a family, then athletics would have to be the prodigal son. Despite allegations of misconduct by both players and coaches recently, college sports fans are usually more than willing to forgive them their transgressions and welcome them back into the flock. So, do student athletes get enough oversight? Should they be paid? Do their sports programs pull scarce resources from university academics or attract alumni support? And what exactly is the proper balance between academics and athletics? Well, I think college athletics is a heck of a lot more commercialized now. Alan Risher was an all-SEC quarterback who played for LSU from 1979 to 82. With the advent of uh, super media, the internet, and things of this such, the, uh, uh, the whole idea of the institution name, even for LSU, is, is huge. It's a brand. It's a marketing concept now. So, uh, you know, back when I was playing, there were one game a week on Saturday. Now you've got 15 to 25 games being televised. With profits of $43 million, LSU's football program is the sixth most profitable in the country. This fact allowed the LSU Athletic Department to contribute nearly $8 million back to the university in 2010. But of the state's 11 public universities with Division I sports programs, only LSU's operates without support from taxpayers. Louisiana Tech's football conference champions, the Ragin' Cajun Football Bowl victors, and the Colonels of Nickel State all reside in sports programs that rely on more than $3 million from their universities to stay afloat. The athletic departments at Grambling and Southern University also depend upon funds from cash-starved university budgets in order to remain profitable. Southern has lost $17 million in state appropriations over the last four years and is facing declining enrollment. I don't think we can place our overall decline in student enrollment on whether we have a, a winning athletic program or not. Southern University Chancellor James Lorenz notes that in a school more famous for its band, sports still play a role in the economic equation. A, a less than successful season for whether it's football or basketball means you know, fewer revenues, uh, then we have to subsidize you know, that deficit through general fund revenues you know, that could be used to deliver services to, you know, uh, you know, into academic programs and maybe provide scholarships. So, you know, it's important for us, it's important for every, I think, university to, to maximize its revenues. College sports is not designed to generate uh, profit for the university. That's not its purpose. Its purpose is not to generate money. LSU System President John Lombardi teaches a course on intercollegiate athletics. Lombardi says the purpose of college sports is to generate skills for the student athlete and maintain a constituency for the university, one which can be called on in the future. When I come to you when you're 50 years old and you're very rich, okay, you're very rich, and I say we need to have an honors college endowment, okay, you're not talking to me like I'm some stranger from a university I no longer recognize. You're talking to me as a, as a member of the same university that you belong to then and you belong to now. While alumni support may be generated by a successful team, more of those dollars will go towards athletic spending than education-related activities, approximately six times more, according to a 2010 report by the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics. 
Despite this, the National College Players Association found that the average Division I athlete on a full scholarship ends up having to pay nearly $3,000 out of pocket annually, leaving 85 percent of players living below the federal poverty line. Our scholarship since uh, the early 70s has been room and board, tuition and fees, and course-related books. But we've continued to call it a full scholarship. The reality is it's not a full scholarship. Wright Waters is the commissioner of the Sunbelt Conference, which includes ULL and ULM. He supports a proposal by the NCAA, the governing body for college sports, that athletes on full scholarship receive an additional $2,000 supplement. But Waters rejects any movement towards paying them. I don't think we ever should apologize for amateur athletics. And I think if when we start paying for play, we have crossed over any definition that exists uh, for amateurism. So I think it's incredibly important that we maintain that amateur status. I think we need people on our campuses that are there because they want the intercollegiate experience and uh, the academic values that go with it. Over 125 schools have asked the NCAA to reconsider the scholarship supplement at its January convention. Many have concerns about being able to provide the perk to both male and female sports programs as required by the federal law known as Title IX. The NCAA also recently strengthened its academic standards, requiring teams graduate 50 percent of their players in order to qualify for postseason play. While some Louisiana football programs like Louisiana Tech and LSU have been recognized for graduating 75 percent or more of their players, half of the eight teams banned from 2011-2012 postseason play because of poor academic performance are from Louisiana. While some schools struggled with their athletes' performance in the classroom, LSU assistant professor Prosanta Chakrabarti is basking in the glow of the Tigers' football success. The interest generated in the school uh, doesn't just uh, limit itself to the sports teams. It's uh, also spilling over to academia and the research that we're doing here. And I think the research getting done at LSU is fantastic. So I'm glad that uh, we're getting this extra bump of attention. Dr. Chakrabarti is an assistant professor and a curator at the LSU Museum of Natural Sciences. He says the LSU brand makes it easier to recruit students and researchers. Chakrabarti, who has identified nine species of fish and been recognized by the International Institute for Species Exploration, was himself drawn by sports to the school. I was not really all that familiar with LSU uh, in terms of biology but I knew the name. I knew the name from, I knew Shaq went here. And so when, you know, they had an advertisement uh, for an ichthyologist, I thought, great, they have an ichthyology department. I would love to be part of that university. So that, well, the initial steps were certainly through sport that got me interested in the academic end of LSU. Well, as you saw, that was the honey badger in that last scene. Well, he might not care, but I have a studio full of folks who do. Uh, joining us for tonight's discussion are Baton Rouge area residents who were randomly recruited and surveyed for us by LSU's Public Policy Research Lab. We also have two high school members of the Legislative Youth Advisory Council from Alexandria and New Orleans. Welcome to everyone. Now reviewing some of the survey responses, when asked if they think college athletes need more oversight than what they currently receive, a total of 60 percent of respondents agreed. 21% disagreed, and 19% were unsure or neutral. Asked whether student athletes should be paid a salary above what they receive for tuition, 56% of those surveyed said no, 38% said yes, and 6% were unsure. Asked if football and basketball coaches deserve to earn millions of dollars, a total of 54% of respondents disagree, 31% agree, and 16% were either unsure or neutral. And when surveyed on whether they think there is a conflict between the commercialization of college athletics and academic values, 50% said yes, 39% said no, and 11% were unsure. So let's start there. Are college sports more like professional sports, and does that cause conflict with uh, academics? Let's go to our audience and talk about that very subject. What is it about 
college and professional sports that's really that different? And do you think that college sports are more like uh, amateur sports or professional sports? Roy, how about you? Well, based on what I know about college football and being an LSU fan for 50 plus years and having a son who played for LSU for four years as a walk-on, uh, college sports is basically an amateur sport and it should always be considered an amateur sport. But what I think has happened in this day and time, so many of these kids that are good, that have the potential to make it to the next level, in their late sophomore and junior years, they start leaning toward leaving the colleges before their final year. And I think that gives the player and the school sort of a, a scenario of being a melting pot for professionalism. And I think that if these kids that are that good to remain in the amateur status, they need to play for four years and not worry about this three-year, multi-million dollar contract. That's and, just my and opinion. And Roy, just before we go on, did your son make it all the way through? And, uh, yes, he did. He was a walk-on, uh, dressed out for the first year with all the games. When uh, Coach DiNardo came in, he made him a starter, and he started for three years on special teams. Claire. Well, I think college sports is more exciting, and people see the activity compared to professional sports. And we have to remember that they're, at, they're students first. And something, this is something that they've dreamed of playing since they were little. And they can, you know, watching it on TV when they were young. And they have the choice, they have the privilege of playing sports. And they have to be able to keep up with the demand. If it's important that they maintain their academic success as also their athletic success because they reflect the university. I, and I wonder whether everyone thinks of them as students first, but that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. I know John wants to jump in here on this point. There is a passion, I feel, in the college students today. Um, they are moving more to the NF, NFL side, the, the professional side as they're coming in now. Uh, I don't know if that's due to the, the coaching process or the, the program process of each college because they're, they're structuring their programs around an NFL type scenario or what. But I know that college students, to me, that's why I prefer college, is it's the passion that they have in their hearts to play. You know, and, to, and to this, this subject about paying them, no, leave that out. You don't think so. Rosemary, no. do you agree with that? I think it's wonderful theoretically. It's wonderful to say these are enthusiastic young men who are just there to have a great time. Realistically, they're looking for a job. If they're good enough to play at the next level, is it fair to say to them, you must play four years of college ball, maybe you break a leg, maybe you'll tear up a knee, maybe you won't be able to sign that uh, six, eight figure contract because you're no longer physically able. It sounds a bit mercenary, but in fact, if you're going to make a living at something and somebody offers you really big dollars, I think it's pretty hard to ask them not to do that. Ideally, I think they would all stay four years. Um, from my point of view, I should say we have four children. They've all played organized sports, if that isn't an oxymoron, from the time <laughs> they were uh, three or four years old, through middle school, through high school, through college, through semi-pros, and I have one professional athlete. So I've watched sports develop a long way, and I will tell you that it's a hard job. They work very hard. By the time you're at the college level, it's a job. I'm not suggesting they should be salaried, but I think they shouldn't be living below the poverty level. There David, needs to be a middle. you want to carry this on? Um, I believe that when you, when you are in a college setting and you play professional sports, you, you are going to the university for academics, whether you're going for sports or not. You're, you're, getting, you're getting an education. So you, the, just by you playing sports, you will get recognition and everything. But I don't believe that you should be paid to play sports, because play uh, amateur sports, for the reason that you know, you, you, when you play for that team, you are investing 
the, if you if you believe that you're going to go to a, a professional level, then you're investing with a our, your, our, your time. Are scholarships not some form of payment? Well, scholarships are a form of payment, but when you're really getting down to the nitty gritty, um, you know you you are you are still representing the school, and you're you're definitely getting praise and honors and, and everything off that when, when you I look mean, at TV. For those of us who weren't college athletes, it sounds like a lot of fun. And, and oh, I'll yes. tell you, maybe, maybe I, but we know it's a lot of hard work too. And mm -hmm. Tyler. Oh yes, I, I have two things to say. Sure. Um, what Clam said about the students first, but like technically they are two um, students first, but the media doesn't see them as students first. Like with the Jordan Jefferson incident, like since he's the quarterback for LSU, to Louisiana State, he's like some type of superstar because like of the publicity that he gets. About about them being paid, like they they should get. I don't. I'm not gonna say they should get like some type of thousand dollar salary, but they should get like more than what they receive because all of the money that they regenerate and the recruits that they bring and the students that they bring, they're doing more than just playing football. They have they have the state of Louisiana itself spending more money and time to the college, for the college. Well, and we'll talk about a little bit more with our panelists about where the money comes from, and particularly with LSU's uh, football program, it's a somewhat different story on the financial end than it is for a lot of the other colleges. But Kelly is anxious to get her word in here. <laughs> well, I would just, I hear a lot of the all or nothing approach. And when I was thinking about the process of going from amateur to professional, a lot of that process involves internships to where you're able to develop these student athletes as interns and interns are always paid or not always a lot of times they're paid especially when you're talking about a big money maker like athletics now uh, Clyde uh, you are wearing red tonight you are aware of that right Do you understand <laughs> what that might imply to the rest of the, the audience <laughs> well there is some uh, levels of compensation we, we talk about it being amateur but when you set rules up, there's people who are, are very smart about bending rules and getting around rules, such as a lot of the athletes are given uh, six season tickets a year. And more often than not, uh, they have an opportunity to sell four of those tickets to someone in, that will approach them from the alumni. So they have a little way of making some other money yeah, on so the side. so they have a way to make mm -hmm. some money. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have work study uh, jobs for them, uh, which may be watering the field, although it's a uh, automatic sprinkler system. <laughs> so, but I mean, there are ways that some of these players can be and are compensated. Now, Tucker, our, our, one of our high school students, what, what, what are you looking at? Uh, I believe that there's, there's no way you can pay college athletes because if you were to think about it, if a college athlete was paid, there's a group that is paying somebody to do a service. That's an employer. That's an employee. That can be taxed. Mm -hmm. And if some people think it won't be taxed, it will. If there's a need for money by a government, local, state, or federal, they see somebody employing somebody to perform a service, that's taxable. And that right there is going to determine it for several, if not almost all colleges and universities, they're going to avoid it altogether because they would lose their tax exempt status. You've given this a lot of thought, have, yes. haven't you? <laughs> Christian, um, success in college athletics, does it make for a better academic university? What do you think? I think it does. Um, the, the reason I wanted to come to LSU whenever I graduated from uh, high school was because of the football team. I had come down a couple of times uh, while I was in high school and attended some football games, and I said, I've, I've got to come here. Um, so I, I think it, it, it definitely does draw students. Uh, like we saw in the program earlier, it, we saw that you know even professors and faculty are drawn to LSU from the success of the athletic department. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, I think overall, you got to look at the big picture and that it, it's a university, you know, Foremost, it's it's Louisiana State University and athletics. Although it's it's a huge part, especially of the Baton Rouge culture, uh, it's 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 a, it's a it's it's a university. It's and, a huge and part of the culture. It is it is the religion yeah. here. And, it and is, but of course, it it's it's a huge part of the culture in a lot of different parts of the state. That but have both. Let me ask Yusuf, your neighbor. We only have another minute, Yusuf. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that, or are we spending too much on college athletics? Um, I think. Uh, 
the money that's generated determines what is what is spent. I mean, a few, well, not a few, but maybe 10, 15 years ago, not that much money was being generated by the university. But as we go, ticket prices are going up and making money off of paraphernalia, <coughs> Uh, selling these players' jerseys, which in essence is selling their names. So, of course, you're going to, the, the, the money's going to go up. There's money out there. Yes. I think that's what, that's much we, we have determined. Well, uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this portion of our show. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further explore college athletics versus academics. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight we're discussing the relationship between college athletics and academics in Louisiana. Joining us now is our panel of experts. Marcus Randall was an LSU quarterback who played on the 2003 BCS National Championship team. Randall also played for the Tennessee Titans and the Green Bay Packers of the National Football League. He currently serves as Dean of Students at Woodlawn High in Baton Rouge. Rob Bernardi is the athletic director of Nichols State University in Thibodeau. During his 11-year tenure, he has pushed for increased sports funding through student fees and improved the graduation rates of athletes. He also has served on numerous NCAA committees. Kenneth Miles is the executive director of the Cox Communications Academic Center for Student Athletes at LSU. The center provides an all-inclusive student-centered support structure for over 500 student athletes. In his prior position at Syracuse University, Miles helped the SU football program achieve a 100% graduation rate in 2000. Well, let's begin with Mr. Randall. And Mr. Randall, my first question to you and what everybody wants to know is the national championship team that you played on, could it beat the current LSU team. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think that year we, um, us and uh, and Oklahoma led the um, led the nation with, with defense that year, and so far the same same to this year. Uh, but I think not to put our team down. I think I think this year's team probably can probably can compete with any of the teams. Proud to well, however great your your and, team was um, in 2003, that's football. what everybody wants to hear. I know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you have been both a student athlete and a professional athlete. Did you really consider yourself to be an amateur when you were uh, in college sports? And and really, how different was it being a, a, a student athlete versus a professional? Um, well, as far as college, I mean, I did look at myself as a student athlete first. Um, had to go to class still, because if you didn't make those grades, then you couldn't play regardless. So it was, it was kind of like a high school feel. Like you had to make a certain grade point average. You had to have a certain amount of credits during each year. So, um, so it was more of a student. The, the student part was first. So you had to do that, but, um, but you also had to go out and com compete and do what you had to do as far as the football aspect too. How about that? And it, I'm going to ask all three of you the same question now. Uh, you know, uh, uh, LSU system president John Lombardi and, and many others have talked about how athletes, they shouldn't necessarily get a salary or, or, or big bonus packages, but they should get what's called full compensation, something more than just uh, covering the current scholarship amounts uh, that would cover some more of the expenses that they have by going to college. And let's start with you, Mr. Miles, down the road. Whether you think uh, that is a good conversation to have, whether that's a good idea. Well, I guess the first thing that I'm thinking about is what does a degree mean as it relates to the amount of money that's being associated with it? I think degrees are invaluable. You can't put a price on it. So to sit down and note that an individual should be paid additional compensation, I'm going to have to say no. I think one of the things that we can do um, is perhaps look at some things, much like scholarships are offered throughout an institution for any type of academic programming, and perhaps look at the incentives that might be associated with those grants for those people who are doing research. I think at that point it's a much more equitable way of uh, being able to provide funds to students overall. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about your center, I hope, a little later on. Uh, Mr. Bernardi, tell me what you think of this question. I tend to agree with Mr. Miles. I think that um, and disagree really with, with, with Chancellor with Dr. Lombardi. 
I think the student athletes currently with a full scholarship is you know is is enough to get them what they what they need and it, it's uh, for most college students uh, if or most parents of college students if we told them look we're going to pay uh, tuition room book fees uh, and board for your kid to go to school I think they'd be overjoyed with it uh, I don't think uh, for the most part uh, certain the universities can afford it uh, and, I, and I think that's clearly uh, was I think uh, in the survey here 56 percent of the people have agreed with that but uh, overwhelmingly I think uh, for institutions to provide that extra financing I think it would be very difficult. It would be tough but uh, what do you think Mr. Randall? Um, I kind of um, agree with these guys. Um, if you start paying players I think the integrity of the college football game would, uh, would uh, not even be the same. Um, if you start putting it on paying players and then you got to get into who, who gets paid what why these players get paid the, the um, amount of money they get paid and every college won't be able to pay their players the, the same money so I mean if you start paying players I think that the scholarship basically takes care of itself you and think so you think that's enough and when you were in college would, would it not would it, how much a different difference would it have made if you'd had a little bit bigger package um, I mean, <laughs> if you <laughs> had paid, I, mean, I would have turned it down but just, <laughs> now I get to talk about the whole aspect of the whole thing right, but um right. but even even from when I was playing to now, the um, the marketing and, and selling paraphernalia, like some of the people um, said earlier in the show, I mean, um, that's 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 going up tremendously as well. Selling the jerseys, selling all kind of school, it so, has. so they're raising money. But I think, as far as them paying for their tuition, paying for your room and board, feeding you meals, um, giving you scholarship checks, that, that can um, basically take care of a lot of those small things that they like gas and 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 extra food that you may want. It um, adds up, and I, I know this discussion is going to continue. Thanks. And Norris, in our audience, let's go to our audience now. Norris, you uh, you have a question for the panelists you, you were bugging me about earlier. I do. My question is um, uh, specifically to Mr. Bernardi. Uh, I believe that he's affiliated with the athletic department at what, Nichols State? Yes, sir. Okay. My question is, what would be the mechanism that you would bring forth to make academics and sports more synergetic and have a comprehensive program that would not only deal with the athleticism of an individual but the academics as well and to make it a priority in sports for the administration to emphasize the need for academic support, uh, social uh, grace, and, and various aspects that would make the student a more complete individual rather than a sports figure, jock, celebrity, or what have you. Good. Well, overwhelmingly, uh, student athletes uh, on most campuses aren't the celebrity or higher profile people that uh, I think we tend to to look at here in Baton Rouge because of the success of the football program. You know, and, and overwhelmingly, I think the student, uh, uh, the student athlete and the uh, academic side of the university are blended well. So in, in the early 1990s, the NCAA came up with some, some really stringent uh, legislation, which did away with the uh, individual dining halls uh, and, and, and uh, dorms and made the student athlete integrate with the student body. And so I think for, for the most part, the student athlete experience is very similar in a lot of ways to the general student experience. And I think uh, we are continuing to try to make that experience even closer aligned. Now, Oren, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier. I know you had one you wanted to pitch at the panel. Yeah, I was interested to know, and this may be for a different discussion, but the, the cost of tuition in general at every university seems to be increasing Therefore, it, does it put extra um, responsibility on the athletic department to continue to earn, raise money to help these athletes get into school, get them an education, even for those um, who are not going to be professional athletes, to get an education, to earn a degree, to go into the workforce and, and contribute to society? Mr. Miles, why don't you give that one a shot? One of the things that athletic departments I know are doing is actually trying to create endowed scholarships. So one of the things that can happen from that, it will have a minimal impact down the road because you'll be able to draw off the uh, interest of those for the scholarships. 
In terms of cost of attendance, I think there's also an assessment that's done too to determine when looking at board checks uh, for student athletes. So basically there's a formula that's created that is assessed based on the environment of where they're living to determine what's an appropriate check to disperse to student athletes. Can I follow up with a question? Is, is, that, is that equal across the board or is that left up to each institution? Does the NCAA provide oversight for that? Each institution, the basic the NCAA gives you guidelines okay. and it's up to the institutional, their climate, their culture of how they actually do business. Okay. Jerry. Uh, I think you know Mr. Randall, don't you? Yeah, uh, yeah, I know him. So, so we're counting on you. <laughs> we're counting on you to give him his toughest question of the night. Uh, so. uh, well, actually, Marcus, I mean, um, why do the uh, well? You pay, you pay for LSU. I'm mm -hmm. a big LSU fan. Why do the uh, put you know publicity on players? You know, and when they're getting in 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 the uh, confrontation. Um. I mean, the media likes to, you know, bring oh, right. bring things to, to the forefront, and a lot of times it, it, there is, you know, so much good things going on okay. that, that they want to show that there's also, you know, different things that, that, that happens on the back end. We, we don't just we, we don't just praise them when, when they're doing good, okay. but we also want to show show the community that you know that they are doing some bad things too as well. Mm -hmm. I, and I guess they're doing that just to just to make it say, okay, these guys are. Are the human people? You know, they're the same as the uh, as the rest of the people that, that's in, in this community, and and also just to show, because a lot of people say and like to bring up, you know, the athletes get treated special privileges. Yeah. They, they get um they get certain things that a normal person w wouldn't get. So, uh, in my eyes, that's what I think that that the uh, media try to show. Also, the, the the other side of it, you know, those guys get punished too okay. when, when they do wrong. Okay. So. Yeah. Richard, you had a question about making these programs affordable. Uh, yes, you know, I was wondering how, uh, it seems to me that, that everything is driven by our public interest in, in, in college athletics. We make a lot of demands. Uh, we want to see a winning team at LSU. And, uh, you know, we're, we've got to go get players for that. Uh, and my, my question is, uh, uh, is and all of this. How do how do how do we keep control of it and keep it affordable? Uh, because there are a tremendous number of demands that are made on institutions and on taxpayers too. On and uh, this just keeps going up. I believe we've had some comments on this. Uh, how do we keep control of this thing without smothering it down? I think it's a good question, and it may be a little bit different at LSU than the other schools. So why don't we ask Mr. Miles and Mr. Bernardi both to try to address that question? Uh, funding at LSU basically is self-generated. So there are no state dollars, there are no fees taken from students that's incorporated within their budget. So essentially the money that they generate from concessions, ticket sales, um, basically cover the operating expenses of that. In addition to that, uh, being one of the schools that made a made a profit, and I believe I, I think the, uh, the the preface noted at six in the country or so. Uh, a lot of that money is actually given back to the university. So uh, I think they note eight million. Uh, I would tell you it's a little more like nine million is actually given back to the institution. But this on is unusual, basis. right? I mean, that not most unusual. colleges don't have this situation. Mr. Correct. Bernard, Mr. Correct. Bernardi, tell me about uh, some of the other situations. Well, I think there's a great deal of stress not only on institutions but on state support to support their institutions. You know, it used to be that uh, state universities were funded. Now they're simply supported, uh, and the amount of money provided to those schools has dwindled. Uh, recently, I was uh, on the West Coast. I was at the University of Oregon. Eight percent of, of the total university budget, at the University of Oregon, comes from the state. The rest comes from the university. So more and more institutions are looking at potential of having to privatize themselves to support themselves. Uh, the other, and, and that's why you're, I think you're seeing, particularly in the state of Louisiana, the increase in tuition, because that's how we're making in, state institutions are making up for the the uh, differential in funding that they used to get from the state. So, so at LSU, uh, the football program's obviously making money for the school, but there are all these other schools where this is not happening. Why, why should we continue to do that? You know, society decided a long time ago, um, long before LSU was uh, as high profile it was, or even Notre Dame or some of these other schools, that sports was important. 
and it's part of our culture and it's part of the American, the fabric of America. And so we'll continue to try to fund and try to uh, do what we do in, in, com in mingle higher education with athletics. Let's go back to our audience. Gerald, your turn. Well, leading into that, what you were just talking about, what about the economic effect that it has on the metropolitan area of the school where it's located? Because I read a report from uh, Dr. Lauren Scott that in 2001, for every LSU home game, it was a $4 million economic impact to the Baton Rouge metropolitan area. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a big thing that if you take that away or, or downgrade it or water it down, uh, you're going to have a lot of less people working and, you know, it has a trickle-down effect as well. Well, good comment. Any quick question you want to hit him with? Well, uh, well I want to know about the state. What can we mm -hmm. do, uh, the state legislature, as far as, you know, getting them to readjust the way that they make the cuts to higher education? I mean, that's, that's a big thing. Does, well, does any, do any of you want to take that one on? <laughs> well, you know, states have to set priorities. And if higher education is not a priority, then the funding will, uh, will, will demonstrate that. And quite frankly, in this state, higher education has not been the priority that it has in other places. Now, Raymond, you haven't had a chance to, to jump in here, and I know you're just itching to, so... <laughs> Well, I've been trying to be real calm about this, <laughs> and I guess you can tell uh, they've hit some of the strongest points. But uh, first and foremost, I respect everybody's opinion here, but uh, even our panelists. But um, I tell you, I, I think we're in a dream world talking about uh, not paying athletes. Let's look at it in a realistic world. Everybody makes money on college athletes, but the student athlete himself or herself. The state makes money, the college makes money, hotels, motels, Holiday Inn, all of them make money. Academy makes money. All these entities make money except that student athlete. Who do you go to see when you go into that stadium? You don't go to see the chancellor. You don't go see the president of the university. You go see those students play. Those students come there and they put their heart out there on that field. And t you call them a student athlete first? Not today. 20 years ago? 15 years ago? Yes. Today, those students put that heart out on that field because they have one goal in mind. Well, two, to graduate and get to the pros. But everybody makes money off of them while they're in school. Let's follow up Mr. Miles on that because how, how many of these players really get to the pros? You're talking less than 2%. Oh, not many. And then you're what, about 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 what about at LSU? Longevity. Yeah, even at LSU. I don't know what the actual statistic, but I do know that the majority of the uh, players from any state is from the state of Louisiana. Right. Um, and, I, and I do hear what you're saying, but I think, again, it goes back to the fundamental question when you put a price tag on a degree, what does it equate to? I think the other part to that, though, is looking at, you're dealing with societal problems and expecting a resolution to happen at post-secondary education. Things have to happen beyond the doors of, of LSU. Our center, I can tell you, does do things that work on the personal development of student athletes, talk about career planning, talks about some of those life skills, and develop academic plans. Do you have chaperones who follow the students around? Uh, do you I have GPS locators? Uh, yeah. I mean, we, I, I that's like what the put, fans want to know. I would know. like to put computer chips yeah. in everybody, <laughs> and that's why it's easy to monitor where they're going. Right, right. Um, but the reality, I guess, to some degree, all of our jobs have expanded roles, mm -hmm. coaches, administration. Uh, as an educator, uh, to some degree, I function as a chaperone. On any given mm -hmm. day, I'm a social worker, big brother, daddy. You know, well, so well, all how, do, how do these how do these student athletes in your center? How do they view themselves? Do they view themselves as future pros? Do they view themselves as I mean, uh, uh, as as amateurs? Truly, um, I think that's a question we have to survey the student athletes. I, I think that they view themselves as uh, perhaps athlete first and student second. But I also think we got a portion of folks who recognize that there is a duality between both, and I am a student mm -hmm. athlete. Mm -hmm. Rosemary wants to pile on here. <laughs> no 15 yards for me, not even five. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but I do think it's important that we 
talk about the fact that by the time you get them, by the time the university gets these young people, their education in many cases is so lacking that you're mm -hmm. dealing with a horrendous problem. You have to begin with basics. When you get a college graduate, I mean a high school graduate in college, and he or she cannot read, you have a real problem. There's only so much your academic program mm -hmm. can do. I think we have to look at much earlier education. We have to get these young people prepared for college by educating them from kindergarten through 12, by monitoring mm -hmm. that, by being sure that because they're a jock, they weren't handed a diploma. Well, let's let's ask our jock um, <laughs> about, about that. I mean, you, you had education K through 12 in college. How would you compare the college experience and the kind of academics you got in college versus uh, your, your education prior to that? Um, well, actually, coming out of high school, I graduated fourth in my class, so I really didn't have a problem going into college because I had those study skills that I learned coming all the way up through K through 12. Mm -hmm. But as of dean of students now, and I'm getting to see a lot of not just athletes just kids in general that they're not getting the, the fundamental part coming up because when those kids can't can't take that basic test and and skills that, that they should have learned from fifth sixth and seventh grade just, just a regular um, do you English run, class, do you run into class. high school athletes who think hey I don't need to worry about anything my athletics are going to carry me through my life does right. that happen that, that happens plenty of times and since I've been at Woodlawn in the last two years I've seen Plenty of, of kids come through with the ability to go on and play college, and and my thing is stressing to those that when colleges come in here, they already know you could play if they come in here. The first place they want to go is to the guidance council to see a transcript. Exactly. And a lot of those colleges backed off. I think I had like one of the best receivers in our own state this year, and a lot of those colleges come in, and once they see their transcript, you know, and, and it and it looked like they may not they may not qualify then they're on to try to find the next best guy. Okay, you're going to get a lot of phone calls about that receiver. <laughs> he waited. <laughs> you know, Tucker, Tucker's our high school student. Uh, tell, tell us what you're, you're thinking. Uh, when it comes to the graduation rate, and the, there's universities have to have 50% graduation rate, that seems out of place. I'm a high school athlete, and for all high school athletes, if you're not on track to graduate, you would even step out on the practice field. What's your sport, by the way? Uh, I do three sports, cross country, soccer, and I run track all year long doing sports mm -hmm. and so if we're high school students are held to you need to graduate first and so why is it that so many colleges can only need to graduate 50 percent yet so many athletes are able to play and they, they don't come to graduate I think part of that Tucker depends on what numbers you're hearing the federal graduation rate only looks at first-time full-time fall enrollment does not take in consideration mid-years, transfers, mid-year freshmen, into the equation. It's over a six-year span. Graduation success rate includes mid-years, okay? So anybody who's coming in mid-year will be calculated within the graduation, and it does not penalize you if somebody leaves in good academic standing. So to give you a short uh, explanation of that, if you have a cohort class of two people that come in, uh, and let's say both of them went to another institution, let's say Florida once went to Oregon. Even if they go and get their degrees, it would be a 0% graduation rate for LSU. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the what, way the numbers work. That's on the federal side. Graduation success rates would say, okay, if they left in good academic standing, we won't penalize you for that. We'll look at who came in mid-year and calculate it from there. Yeah. We all now have heard through the news, through ESPN, through all the medias that the NCAA now is talking about this extra monies that college athletes, and I guess you've all heard of it, I don't know a lot about it, but I know enough about it to talk about it. If the NCAA gives the universities the chance to do this, and there was monies available, and I don't know what dollar value or whatever, would the universities be able to put that money in an account for each player? have some form or faction of yeah, someone that's, in the It's a good question. Remember, there's two really two, there's a second part of that question yeah. you have to remember because of Title IX, which yes. basically, is, is that the question you yes. had, Gerald? Yes. Title IX, if you had to pay every athlete at your school, not pay, I'm sorry, stipend. And just let me add, by Title <laughs> IX, we, we, we mean oh. that women's athletic programs women's need to be supported team, along with, with everybody. women. I that's say what everybody we're trying that's to. on a scholarship, mm -hmm. whether it be male or so female. Could, could so you afford to, or what impact would that have on the total program of right. your university? Well, 
uh, it had a significant impact, not only at Nichols, but I suspect that, you know, we're, we're talking about, I think we had talked earlier about institutions who were actually, you know, making their uh, revenues or higher than ex their expenses. You're talking about there are 331 NCAA Division I institutions. Only 20, only seven of them, 7%, 22 institutions of the 331, 7% are in a situation like LSU where their revenues are higher than their expenses. Every other institution loses money. And if you're talking about adding three to 500,000 or even a million dollars in, reven in money to be provided to the student athletes, the institutions just don't have it. So you have the, the, the money problem itself and then also the Title IX issue. Do you, you, know, do you give the full scholarship athletes, the, the football, men's, women's, basketball, student athletes more than you give the partial scholarship athletes, the, the soccer players, the uh, uh, men's tennis players. How do you divide that up? Okay, so not it's a good never plan be for a lot of schools, but would it be a good plan for LSU, which can't afford it? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that separate the, the athletics at LSU even more and make the football team mm -hmm. even, even, even tougher to beat? I think that's relatively speaking because the impact is greater just than on football. You're talking about having new facilities for our other sports to be able to compete as well. Mm -hmm. I think you're looking at the amount of money that's also going to be dispersed out to the university may also just uh, decrease, which may take away from some academic programs. So I think the impact, regardless of whether or not there's some fiscal stability or not, is still going to have an impact. Um, and to what degree, I think that becomes a relative term at that point. Clyde. You know, I looked at the mission statements. Uh, from several of the Louisiana universities and from the academics I never saw anything in any of those statements that said anything about athletics that the mission of the universities number one was education so as we keep funding more and more athletics we're taking more and more away from academia now how many people can we educate from an expansion of Tiger Stadium? That's state funded, that's not LSU funded from the athletic department. Any expansion to any of that, those facilities are bonded money designated from the legislature. So my question would be, at what point do we start defunding athletics and start refunding academia whenever we have graduation rates at these universities that I don't even want to say it out loud here. They're well, so low. I, I, I wonder, I mean, if, uh, if you have a, a college athletic program and uh, it, it draws uh, a lot of passion among the alumni and, uh, and the students, I mean, isn't that an attraction for people who give to the university? And, and, and is, isn't that part of the lifeblood of a, of a university to have an athletic program? I'm just, I'm just trying to give a devil's advocate well, here. Well, we want to talk about quality of life and what goes on in the community, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of price tag can you put on it? But then what's the well, price it, tag of not supporting academia another part to the of, No, another part of the question is if you have an athletic program, does mm -hmm. that, is that part of the formula for people to give money to the school? That they, they, you know, they love the school, they love the athletics, and they love the academics, and they give money to the school. It's a good question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But, but that's but a very Kelly, small percentage, those endowments. Yeah, are well, small. maybe. <laughs> Kelly? Well, when you were talking about the mission being to educate, that mm -hmm. was the mission of the universities. I consider athletics a performing art which is, you know, part of an education of a person. It, the network, the, it, the, it, the, the television it world would, would agree with you. Right, it exactly. A it's a yes, huge, yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> it teaches courage and critical thinking and teamwork. I mean, it is part of educating a whole person, and that is what education is about. It's not separate. It's all part of the package. It's called Monday morning critical thinking. Right, right. all about that. <laughs> well, let's, let's go, let's go to comment, date. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead, jump I in. Just jump comment, in. Go what ahead. she was saying, because I, you know, I, I strongly um, agree with, with some of the things she was saying. Because I know that through athletics, I mean, I know through um, academics, you know, I've learned a lot, you know, it taught me a whole lot, but, but through athletics and playing sports, it teaches me a lot of life skills. Um, right how to deal with adversity, how to, how to deal with um, different situations, teamwork, things right. you're going to need in the world, um, how, how to deal with success, how to deal with failure. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's a, those are, are um, a lot of life things that you need to, to know as well. 
as a person. And you had and you have the team aspects of it as as well that we, we've, we've talked about. Uh, David, were you? Um, when he was saying about the academy and um, everyone uh, benefiting, I believe that also that the 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 number of the jersey, whatever forever uh, college you may be representing, it is belong it belongs to the college, not to the player. So, I mean, I do believe somewhat um, they should get some benefit maybe in their um, their college stipend, but um, because their name is on the back of the jersey, if, if it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Really quick, we're running out of time, just 15 seconds apiece, maybe 20. Tell me if you could change one thing about the issues we're talking about right now, what would you, what would you do? I would probably look at educational reform starting at pre-K. And doing, and, and, and with the goal of doing what? The goal of looking at retaining students and graduating them. Good, good point. How about Excellent you, Mr. Point. Bernardi? Excellent point. You know, I think if I could provide some or some general understanding, there, there's so much misinformation, particularly about the NCAA and about funding in general. Uh, Clyde's question, you know, two institutions provide between three and five percent of the money to fund athletics. So a typical athletics department is funded by only 3 to 5 percent of the institution's budget. And people have this concept that, you know, 75, 80 percent of the university budget is dedicated towards athletics. It really isn't. It's a small fraction of really of, of an institutional budget. So I think just providing some, un some understanding, because I think there's a great deal of misunderstanding out there. Mr. Randall. Basically, that's the same thing. Is, um, just educating the people on, on what's going on and time's going to change I mean um as we as the as the years come the, the game's going to evolve and more media is probably going to take place and and that's just where, where we're at and there's a lot of talk on should college players get paid or not um in my opinion I think that shouldn't change I think it, it should always stay that way we, we may can find different ways to compensate those to co compensate those players maybe just by what Mr. Raymond said if you're selling that player's jersey, we all know that's him. I mean, his name not on it. We, we may not pay him now, but whatever that money um, generates, we would, when he graduates, if he graduates from college, we, we uh, have that money set aside, so much money set aside from what he, his paraphernalia sold, and we can uh, give that to him. That's his bonus. If you, <coughs> if you was able to, to be that type of um, player on that level, where well, people want to come out and buy your paraphernalia, which we can't give it to you in college, but certain um certain percentage of that money generated from those type of aspects we, we can set aside and yeah. if you graduate from college very good we, we, we can give you very that. interesting discussion and that 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 is an idea that's being floated out there well i want to thank uh, our panelists uh, I, you gentlemen are really on the ground in the thick of it and i think it made a great conversation our our uh, studio audience y'all did a great job all of you were very uh, enthused and i appreciate it and uh, so but we've run out of time for our question and answer segment so we'd like to thank uh uh, Marcus Randall, Rob Bernardi, and Kenneth Miles for their insight on this month's topic. And when we come back, I'll have a few closing comments. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. Take this month's survey, view extended interview clips, and comment on tonight's show. And we'd love to hear from you, like we did from Joey, following last month's program, Entitlement Cuts and Louisiana's Seniors. Joey writes, Congress and the federal government have borrowed money from the Social Security system for years. Why don't they repay all the money, with interest, that they have borrowed from Social Security and the American people? Well, thanks, Joey, for your comment and for your optimism. Well, ranked 37th nationally for voter turnout, 47th for volunteerism, yet home to numerous chapters of Occupy Wall Street, how truly civic-minded are Louisiana citizens and how can they become more involved? Well, join Louisiana Public Square next month as it examines civic engagement in Louisiana. Well, thanks for watching and happy holidays.
For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.